all right once again we're back for another clip uh this time we're going to be talking about site selection in our last video we talked about production systems uh sources of foundation stock and also the criteria for selection and uh, make sure you check out that video all right so today we're going to be talking about uh, site selection and the equipment and tools you need to start a snow farm or to work on the snow farm so it's going to be a short lecture series uh today's lecture won't be as long as some of the lectures we've had but it's still going to be uh, fully packed with lots of information so site selection site selection has to do with uh where you want to set up your uh, snail farm what are the things you look out for before choosing a site for a snow farm for instance if you're going into poultry farming you understand that because of the smell the oozing of the poultry farm you would want to have your poultry farm at the outskirts of town uh, even though now there are a lot of technologies that have come in uh, like IMO that you will spray on the poultry farm and you won't even know that you have a poultry farm there because it takes care of the smell uh, but now uh, the things like that have come up but or originally if you want to start a poultry farm the first thing you look out for is a very quiet environment where people have not built houses around so that they don't sue you to court for causing uh, a nuisance in the environment so these are some of the things we'll be looking out for south uh, site selection what are the things you look out for in siting your snow farm uh, but this time we're not talking about poultry we're talking about snow farming where uh, where is the perfect place for you to have or run a snow farm so those are the things we'll be looking out for in this uh, lecture video now the first thing you must understand about a snail farm is wherever you want to site the farm it must be escape proof snails are adapt to escaping even in the slightest way you can ever imagine so whatever wherever you are siting your snail farm you must ensure that it is secured from the snails escaping all right so that's one thing you must have at the back of your mind then the second thing that also you must consider before citing a snow farm is the purpose or the goal of the snow farming enterprise. The goal or the purpose, is it a commercial snow farm? Is it a medium scale snow farm? Or is it a small scale snow farm? Now, depending on the scale of production and the goal of production, it will help you determine where to site your snow farm now take for instance if you're looking out for a small scale snow farm you can have it at the back of your house i've had some students uh, clients who even run their snow farms right in their room uh, because like i said when we come to construction of a snowy you can see that you can have a snow farm beside your room you can have it in your kitchen you can have it in your parlor. You can have it by the back side of your house. Now, we're going to show you different designs and type of uh, systems. You can actually wear snails under intensive care and control. So uh, what we are looking at for now is the sighting of a snail farm. So the purpose or the goal of the snail farm will also determine where you keep your farm or where you site your farm. Just like I was saying already, if you want to site a small scale farm, you can have it by your house where you can keep watch. You can actually uh, secure the farm and also observe what is going on on the farm without necessarily employing the services of a third party. So uh, small scale farms should be kept within the living environment. Then for medium scale farm, let's assume you have a large compound that you have fenced. You built your house, a bungalow or a duplex, and you still have some space within the compound, within the confinement of your land. You can have a medium scale farm there, a farm that can house at least a hundred pens, a farm that can take a greenhouse, something around the region of a uh, hundred concrete pens. A greenhouse that can take up to 40,000 snails can also be within the confinement of your building if you have that much space in your compound. 
So small scale and medium scale farms should be kept close to the owner's apartment or to the owner's environment. Then large scale snow farms. For large scale snow farms, you must get a land, a piece of land that is specifically bought for that sole purpose of starting up a farm. Now, this farm must not be in the outskirts of town. You can have it in a GROA. You can have it anywhere. You can have it within where people are built. Why? Because snails do not smell. They don't make noise. And they do not constitute other forms of nuisance to the environment. Sometimes you will have a snail farm. People don't even know what you have going on your farm. They might think it's a fish farm or whatever because they are not noisy. They don't make noise. They, they don't smell. So you can have snail farm anywhere. All you need to do is, if it's a commercial enterprise, make sure that you are able to get adequate land space that will accommodate what you want to build. If it's one acre, if it's two acres, depending on the size of land, you just purchase the land fence it, secure it, and establish your farm. So the first priority you must look out for is the goal of setting up that farm. Is it small scale? Is it medium scale? Is it commercial scale? This will help to determine the site where you keep your farm. And also, remember, whatever system or uh, 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 goal you have, for the production, the building of the farm must be such that the snails cannot escape from the structure. Now, there are other environmental factors that must be looked out for in siting a farm. For instance, the topography of the land. The land preferable for farming of any type of livestock is a flat land. A plain and flat land is easier to construct than a hilly land than, or a slopey land. Because you will do a lot of landscaping in order for you to get your building and dimensions right. As a result of this, we always advise that you get a flat, plain land. But if you don't have that, we can still construct a farm for you in a hill or on a slopey land. It's just that you will spend a little more than you would have done if it's a plain land. So preferably, you must look out for the topography of the land. Two, the soil texture. The soil must be well drained. It must be a well drained soil, not a soil that is waterlogged. For instance, a sandy soil is not good for snow farming because it is very porous and highly drained. Immediately you sprinkle water on it, it's drained off. And also, a clay soil is not completely good for snow farming. Because the water retention ability of a clay soil is very high. So you don't want to have a soil that will get waterlogged within the shortest period of time. And as a result, a humus soil or a loamy soil is preferable for snail production. Both for the land and also for the soil you have inside the pen. A humus soil or a loamy soil. Some persons call it top soil. The soil is dark in color and have very rich organic matter in it. So the topography, the soil texture are also very key ingredients you must look out for in getting a land for snow farming. Then we also look at the temperature. The temperature must not be too hot in the snow farm. As a result of that, you must have shade trees is either you locate or site the farm in a shaded environment where you have already tall trees growing and you set the farm in between the trees or you plant artificial shade trees now these artificial shade trees can be oil palm trees can be coconut trees can be uh, plantain banana trees that are tall that will serve as wind breaks wind is air in motion and heavy winds can pull apart your building. And as a result of that, it can also lead to high levels of evaporation, loss of water from the soil. And snails do not like a very dry soil. 
As a result, you must ensure that the soil is moist. So try as much as possible to avoid dryness within your snow farm. Thus, you must have artificial shade trees planted around your snow farm. So this is also one of the uh, factors you look out for in selecting a site for your snow farm. We have already talked about the soil being well drained. Then you must also look out for feed. Ensure that wherever you have your snow farm, you have good feed availability for your snails. The snails must not go hungry. Because raising animals under intensive or semi-intensive system, one way or the other, the animals depend solely on you for their nutrition because they cannot go out and fend for themselves. So as a result of that, you must ensure that food and water is readily available for the snails. Thus, locate your snail farm where you have feed and water readily available to your snails. And also, the soil must be very rich and loose. Snails lay their eggs under the soil. The soil, if not loose, when they lay the eggs, they incubate them under the soil and the eggs will hatch. When they hatch, if the soil is not loose enough and it's compact, like it's a clay soil becomes very compact when water is poured on it and you don't till the soil. It becomes compact. So the eggs that are incubated under the eggs will remain there. Some of them, majority will not hatch. Those that will hatch, the young hatchlings, the snails, will find it difficult to burrow out to the surface. Why? Because the surface of the soil is very compact. And as a result, they will remain there, starve and die. The, the longest a snail hatchling can go is 10 days without food. Once it hatches out from the shell they can stay for 10 days without food god has made it that way for them because the animal has a very poor mobility and as a result of that they have a food reserve that can sustain them for 10 days without feeding as a matter of fact within that time they might even estivate uh, we'll talk about estivation which has to do with uh, um, a period of dormancy that results in loss of valuable growing time. You see a snail that seals up the mouth. You can see it on the screen. Uh, a, a snail that seals up the mouth with a white calcareous tissue. We call that estivation. Some persons call it hibernation. Yeah, but here in terms of snail farming, we refer to it as estivation. It is defined as a period of dormancy that results in loss of valuable growing time. The snail will seal up its mouth with this white calcareous tissue and will remain in that state of dormancy until water comes close to it. Now, this period of dormancy occurs typically between the months of November to March in the wild, not under captivity, not under intensive system. Because in the intensive system and semi-intensive system, water is readily available to the snails. So they cannot differentiate between the dry from the rainy season. So the snails will lay all year round. But snails that live in the wild, they don't lay all year round. When the peak of the dry season arrives, the snails will estivate. And that is what you're seeing on the screen. The snails will seal up their mouth with this white tissue called epiphram or calcareous tissue that is synthesized from their body. It's a calcium synthesized from their body system. And they seal up like that and will remain in that state of dormancy for a period of four to five months. The snail will not die, it will not feed from the outside environment, it will retain itself within that system because the snail has a food reserve. Now during the dry season, when the snail goes into estivation, it will regurgitate like a ruminant animal, bring back that food that was stored in the reserve and continue to feed on it for maintenance. The snail is not feeding for growth, it is not feeding for production at that time. It is only feeding for maintenance to keep itself alive until the rainy season uh, comes by April. So late March, when the first rains begin to fall in the year, especially here in Nigeria, the snails will break out of estivation. Remember, they went into estivation from the month of November. They will break out of estivation in the month of March, late March to early April. 
which is the peak of the dry season because the ground, the soil, or the earth is very dry. And snails cannot move in a dry environment. They have a slime that helps them to move in a moist environment. So when the environment becomes dry, at the peak of the dry season, the snails can no longer move under those conditions. And as a result, they will go into what we call estivation or hibernation. Now, during this period of time, you are losing the growth level of the snails. You are also losing egg production because no eggs are produced. So if you don't have adequate management system on your farm, this estivation that occurs in the wild naturally will also occur in your farm, irrespective of the season, as long as you don't moisten your soil very well. So we'll look at some of these factors when we come into details of management. But estivation is part of snail farming. Now, many people will tell you that snails have a season they lay and a season they don't lay. That is not true under intensive management and under semi-intensive management. It is only true under the natural habitat when the snails are in the wild because of seasonal changes. But under intensive system, it is not true because as long as you continue to wet your pens, whether dry season or rainy season, the environment is made conducive for the animals to thrive. And as a result of that, they will continue producing. So that is about estivation. So try as much as possible to stop or prevent your snails from estivating as a result of poor management. Now, snails have three major systems or seasons in the wild, which many persons will not tell you about. But as an animal scientist, we go beyond just raising snails for commercial purpose. I cannot start to talk to you about the anatomy and physiology of snail farming because or of snail, anatomy and physiology of the snail, because that has no benefit to you as a farmer, as a businessman. What concerns you is how snail will produce money for you. So the snail anatomy, the head is here, the high is here, the ear is here, it's, it has no uh, financial benefit to you. But to us as academicians who are animal scientists, who do research on these animals for different reasons, we must know these things. So that is why we want to confine this lecture series just to what will produce money for you through snails. But I will just give you these three key uh, areas of snail farming in the wild or how they behave in the wild. We have what is called the uh, breeding season, pre-breeding season, and post-breeding season. Now, the estivation season in the wild starts from November to March, which is the period of dormancy that results in loss of valuable growing time. As the snails will seal up their mouths, they don't feed from the external environment. They feed with the food reserve in their system. So it is also through these systems that I want to talk to you about that they make reserve for the future, for the dry period. Now, the uh, pre-breeding period starts from March to April. Now, remember that estivation starts from November till March when they seal up. And when the early rains come in March, they will break out from estivation. Now, when they break out, they begin to consume food at a quite high rate. Why? Because during the period of estivation, they were only surviving with what they have as a food reserve. So they are not eating to satisfy themselves, but to maintain themselves to stay alive. So now that the early rains have come in March, they are broken out of estivation. They begin to consume food at an alarming rate in order to prepare for the breeding season. Now, this period lasts from March to April ending. Now, between April to July, which is the rainfall season in Nigeria, the rainy season, that is the breeding phase. The breeding phase has to do with the period where the snails will lay almost all their eggs. They lay their eggs between April to uh, July in the wild, not in captivity. Now, all the eggs are laid within that time which we refer to as breeding season. Now, the post-breeding season has to do from between July to November, October ending to November. This period, the snails do not concentrate on laying eggs. What they do now is they begin to consume food at an alarming rate. This food that is consumed is being stored, waiting for the dry season that is coming from November. So from July 
So November, the snails will continue to consume food at an alarming rate. And once it gets to November, when the rains completely stop and the Amatan breeze, the dry season sets in, they will seal up again into estivation. And this food that has been stored from July to uh, November, they begin to re regurgitate, begin to feed on it again and remain in that dormant period until they get to mash again. So that is the cycle of uh, snail production in the wild. But under captivity, this cycle is broken because there's regular inflow of water. In fact, in the greenhouse system, they think it is rainy season all year round. Why? Because the sprinklers are stored above, as you can see on the screen, they are stored above. And once you regulate them, they begin to shower like rain from above. So the snails will thrive all year round. So this period of estivation is broken out. So the snails will lay all year round in intensive system. So uh, that's just a diversion just to get you into detailed studies of snails. So we are still on the site selection. We've talked about uh, topography. We've talked about soil texture. We've talked about uh, security. Yeah, security is another thing we have to look out for. Uh, when, you have, when you decide to set up a snail farm outside the outskirts of your home, you must fence the land and secure it, especially in the Nigeria we live in today. Everything can be boggled. So ensure that you secure your land, fence it, build a security gate, or if possible, build a staff quarter, especially for commercial farms. So the farm attendants will stay on the farm and work on the farm, so they will also be part of the security personnel on the farm. So that is another factor you must consider uh, inciting a, a snail farm. So we've talked about the goal of the production. Uh, we have also talked about available capital resources. We've talked about uh, the topography. We've talked about the texture. We've talked about the drainage system of the land, ensure that the land is well drained. We've talked about the soil quality, ensure that the soil is a humus soil that has rich organic matter. So these are some of the factors you look out for in citing a snow farm then we'll look out for the equipment you need on the snow farm there are certain equipment you need on the snow farm because if you don't provide the right uh, equipment your farm attendants will not be effective so some of the equipment you need on the snow farm you need a scale a scale to weigh the snow should in case you want to sell based on weighing or based on weight so you get a scale for the farm attendants you also get rain boots because the farm attendants will go to the bush, cut the leaves and vegetables that the snails will feed on. As you would know, snails are vegetarians. So we'll talk about feeds and feeding stock. So we'll go into details about the feeding aspect. So one of the tools you need on the farm are rain boots, where this, uh, the farm attendants can wear and go into the bush and harvest the uh, vegetation or the vegetables and fruits that are required for consumption for the snails. Then we also need cutlasses. They will use to cut the leaves and fruits for the snails and also clear around the snary. Ensure that the snary is thoroughly cleared because you don't want creeping things coming into the snail farm because there are many predators and parasites to snails, which we are going to look at much later on this series. Then they also need um, hand gloves to go into the bush and avert some of these things. They also need garden hole that is the garden hoe, is either garden hoe, garden fork, or ant trowel. These three things are the things we use to loosen the soil in the intensive system in order to get the eggs out of the earth and incubate them under the intensive system. You need to till the soil. Why? Because you're putting water on the soil on a regular basis. And if you don't aerate the soil, the soil will become waterlogged or will become compact at some point. The snails can no longer burrow under the soil to lay their eggs because they go underneath the soil to lay their eggs. So you need to get a garden hoe, garden fork, or rake or anchoir to loosen the soil. In the process of loosening the soil, you also pick out the eggs that were incubated under the eggs. 
and take them to the incubator pen. Now, the reason why we we'll move the eggs out of the uh, pen where the snails are and take them to the incubator pen is because there are uh, some parameters that are required for incubation. Now, the three major uh, uh, criteria required for incubation are uh, humidity, temperature, and ventilation. Now, if the temperature is too cold, it will result to poor hatchability. If the humidity is not up to date, it's not optimum, it will result to poor hatchability. If the ventilation is poor, it will result to poor hatchability. Now, you must understand that where the snails are on the intensive system in the pens, we regularly water those pens. And as a result, that pen is quite cold. Now, the conditions that favors good hatchability is not as cold as the snail pens are. So that is why once in a week when we aerate the soil in order to keep the soil in good condition, we also move out the eggs and take them to a separate pen where we incubate them and ensure that these three parameters are met. Temperature, humidity, and ventilation are met in those pens. So the eggs will arch almost 100% or between 70 to 100%. Archability will be achieved. So that is why you need the garden fork O or antrowell on the farm to help you sort for the eggs. Then you also need plastic spoons because the eggs is preferable you don't touch them with your hands. So when you spot the eggs in the pen, you must use the spoon to pick the eggs and introduce it to a bowl that has a cover lid, a transparent bowl with cover lid. So when you pick the egg with the spoon, you put it inside the bowl with the cover lid and you cover it. Why do you cover it? You must cover it until you finish picking all the eggs before you go and incubate. Now, your farm might be a big farm. If you don't cover it and you continue moving around with that bowl or exposed like that, some of the eggs will turn white. Some of them will begin to crack as a result of prolonged exposure to air. Now, when the eggs turn white, the hatchability of those eggs are greatly reduced. And when they crack, of course, you can't even incubate them at all. So if you expose the eggs for a prolonged period, you will see them cracking. You begin very tiny, tiny noise. It's the eggs that are cracking because you're exposing them to air for longer than they should. So you must get a bowl with a cover lid, put the eggs, cover them, and when you're done with sorting or collecting the eggs, you go straight and incubate them at the incubator. You must not waste any time. Don't keep the eggs till the next day before you incubate them. And try not to allow water to come in contact with the eggs for a prolonged period as well. So you take them to the incubator pen and you incubate them. So that is why you need a plastic spoon and a bowl that is transparent with a cover lid so you can have the eggs that are ready for incubation in there. So I think those are the things we need. Then we also need drums, of course, drums for water, buckets to carry water around or to carry the snails around. And uh, what else do we need? Uh, I think we also need um, uh, feed, of course. We have different types of feed. So that we will leave until we get to our topic on feed and feeding stuff. So I think, yeah, we also need wheelbarrows to move materials in and out of the farm. You also need shovel to carry materials like soil into the wheelbarrow and other things that are needed. So. I think we have men mentioned quite a few. We said you need a um, garden hoe, garden fork, and trowel. Any of them is fine. We also need a uh, shovel. We need wheelbarrows. We need uh, cutlasses. We need shovel. And we need a hose. In case it's an intensive system where you don't use the sprinklers, it is best to use a hose. You connect it to the source of water and you use it to water the pens. But if it's a small scale system where you don't necessarily need the hose, you can get a garden spray. This spray can. You get water into it and use the spray can to spray inside the pen. So those are some of the tools that are needed on the snow farm. So this is where we call it a day for this uh, topic. Uh, please, as much as we are uh, training you on this platform with this, we believe these lectures are very rich. And after the training, we might also upload them to the YouTube. So try not to uh, be offended with some of the statements we might be making on this uh, training series. So uh, that's why you must have uh, those tools on the farm. 
So thank you. God bless you. I'm sure it has been a wonderful experience today again. Bye-bye.